All right, we're continuing with our series, uh, Understanding and Obeying the Ten Commandments. This is lesson number eight uh, in that uh, series, uh, entitled The Problem of Abortion. Uh, this is uh, the second part of um, the material on the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. So last uh, time we began our discussion of the sixth commandment and uh, I divided the lesson into three main parts. Uh, one, uh, what the commandment uh, forbids, um, unlawful physical aggression against others, suicide, and the abuse uh, of individuals, uh, all manner of abuse uh, of, uh, of individuals. Second part was the lawful use of force and killing. And we talked about hunting and fishing, that was permitted. A capital punishment uh, is permitted but not demanded by this uh, commandment. Life in prison is a form of capital punishment. Um, uh, the police and military work, uh, we said that all murder involves killing, but not all killing is murder. And of course, police work, uh, so, you know, uh, security work, uh, military uh, defense of the nation uh, is permitted by this commandment and also self-defense. And then the third part, we talked about how to keep the command properly and that was uh, not to take our own revenge and to guard our heart, uh, to uh, try to win over evil with good, and not to allow evil to win out at the expense of good. And um, I will not allow someone, for example, to harm me and my family in order to show them that I love them. I think that was one of the examples that we gave on that. So today, we're gonna look at uh, an issue that is addressed and forbidden by this command and has become one of our nation's um, uh, great controversies and that is the issue of um, abortion. Well, issue of abortion, the key question uh, is of course, when does human life begin? Now common sense tells you that once a seed is planted, the beginning of the cycle of life begins. Uh, this is why very few farmers are you know, pro-abortion. Uh, International Conference on Abortion in Washington, way back 1967, authorities from around the world, from different fields, um, uh, met together to discuss this uh, issue, and their conclusion uh, stated that there was no point in time between the union of the sperm and egg and the birth of the infant, at which point we could say that this was not a human life. Now, I don't think you have to have a conference to figure that out, but they officially made that statement after a long discussion. Uh, U.S. courts have confirmed this decision in the case of fertilized eggs of a woman who won custody of them from her husband. Today, of course, with improved technology, we can actually see uh, that a fertilized ovum is uh, not just a, a potential human being, it is a human being uh, with vast uh, potential. Uh, in Matthew uh, chapter one, verse 20, um, I make a reference here uh, where Matthew writes, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child who has been conceived in her is with the Holy Spirit. And so the, the, the angel refers to the child that had just been conceived in Mary uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit as a child, not as a lump of, 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 uh, of cells. And so God considers uh, what is growing inside of a, a, a woman's stomach uh, as a child with vast uh, potential. The Bible teaches that we're not permitted to take the life of another, no matter what stage of life they are at, whether they're at the very beginning stage of life as during a pregnancy or when they are uh, very old perhaps and, and even close to death. So I, I think it would be helpful in the discussion if we simply looked at the major arguments for abortion in all fairness. Uh, so one of the major uh, arguments for abortion is in case of rape and incest. Uh, it's a very emotional uh, argument. Uh, it's a difficult question because you're put into a situation where it seems cruel to force a person to have a, a baby that has been conceived in this way. The truth of the matter is that uh, the occurrence of this is very rare. 
uh, statistics show that pregnancy for this reason is way below 1%. Now, in a legitimate case of pregnancy caused by rape or incest, the real question is, how will it help the victim of the crime, which is the woman, by committing another act of aggression against her, by killing her unborn child? I mean, two wrongs will not equal a right. Uh, there are cases, uh, uh, these rather are cases uh, that are not easy to decide and there's no painless answer, but having the child will cause less scars than killing the child and it is morally correct and merciful, uh, merciful for that child. Um, psychological uh, reasons, another, um, another uh, necessary uh, or rather uh, abortion uh, advocates say that uh, abortions are necessary because women may have psychological problems if they continue with the pregnancy. Again, Reality here, uh, statistics show that first of all, there is no mental illness that can prevent a woman from having a baby. Uh, secondly, um, if you look at the suicide rates, male suicides, which are 23 per 100,000, that's the average in the uh, United States. Uh, one study in Britain found that of 1,485 women between the ages of 20 and 35 who had committed suicide, only 4%, only 4% for pregnant women. Uh, um, only, only 74 of these 1,485 did so while uh, they were pregnant. So the, the point I'm making here is that the danger of this, the danger of suicide because of pregnancy is uh, overrated. Uh, uh, more psychological problems actually stem from having abortions than being prevented from having an, an, an abortion. And again, studies show uh, that uh, when a woman is having serious psychological problems, having an abortion increased her problems, didn't eliminate these problems. See, most women in the best of circumstances have anxiety and fear and strain and doubt about the pregnancy. Uh, and these are made greater the more difficult her life situation is. However, to have an abortion to relieve these mental problems usually has a negative effect and creates more problems, not less. Also, this reason is given many times as a convenient excuse by women who simply refuse to accept the responsibility of having and rearing uh, a child. Another uh, argument for abortion. Well, every child should be a wanted child. Now, if we follow this reasoning, it gives us a, a right to eliminate unwanted spouses, uh, unwanted people who are sick in our lives or old. I mean, being wanted is the wrong criteria for deciding whether someone has the right to life or not. I mean, statistics show that a significant percentage of the children born were not planned at first, but parents grew uh, used to the idea. Uh, the idea that uh, unplanned children will become unwanted and battered and abused uh, when born is statistically untrue. Statistics show that unplanned pregnancies usually become wanted babies when, when born. In our society, we have a well-developed system to care for these children who are still unwanted at birth. Adoption is still a better alternative than death, especially for the child and also for the mother. The strongest argument today, however, is a woman's right to choose. In other words, having or not having a baby should be the decision of the woman and her right to decide for her own body. That's why they call it the pro-choice movement and not the pro-abortion movement. So what we need is, uh, for this, you know, to answer this argument here, what we need is medical honesty. Um, an appendix, an appendix is part of your body. Uh, its cells are your cells. You have it removed or not removed, you, you decide that. A fertilized ovum lives within the body of the woman, but it has its own genetic code. It is a separate and unique person living within the mother. A, a woman has a right to her own body, yes, absolutely. But the baby inside of her is not her body. 
It's a different body. It's a body being nurtured by her body, but it's not her body. The ability to conceive also carries with it the responsibility to nurture what is conceived. The only way that a, a person can defend abortion on the basis of personal rights and freedoms is by completely ignoring the rights of the unborn child. I mean, both parties have rights to live. Uh, we would never uh, condone a child killing his mother because he didn't want her or she made him feel nervous and tired or she caused him uh, to live in poverty or she interfered with his personal rights and freedoms. We would think that would be ridiculous. But yet we, 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 many people march in the street to defend the right of the, of the woman to, to kill her own child. The ability to conceive and carry a child does not automatically carry with it the right to destroy that child. Um, uh, another uh, argument, if you wish, um, abortion saves uh, malformed children and, and their parents from misery and an unhappy, an unhappy life. Of course, the assumption here is that handicapped and retarded children have a greatly deficient ability to enjoy life. And this has been shown to be untrue. Uh, the handicapped and malformed have the same degree of life satisfaction as people who are normal physically. Uh, with care and treatment, their lives can be fulfilling for them, if not normal by our standards. Uh, we, we shouldn't judge them and their happiness by our standards. You know, because uh, I'm able to walk, let's say, it doesn't mean that the person who is not able to walk cannot be happy. You know, that, that, that's, that's presumptuous on my part. No association of parents of handicapped children has ever endorsed abortion as a means of solving their problems. Abortion as a means of handling handicapped or deformed children was the first step taken by the Nazis in Germany to resolve this problem. It was not long before they had become so dulled in conscience that they saw killing as the solution for those who were also old or sick and eventually those who were just different. Uh, there's a, a very little difference between the master race idea and the quality of life theory of pro-abortionists. Uh, let's destroy people who interfere with the quality of our life. It can happen here. We already have many groups and politicians who support abortion and euthanasia. Uh, this is the first step uh, usually uh, to that uh, ultimate uh, goal. Um, another uh, argument uh, for population control, abortions are needed to keep the population down. Well, uh, the birth rate has dropped in North America and there was no danger here of overcrowding. Uh, mismanagement of our economy and ecology are the problems, not human uh, uh, reproduction. Uh, only 2% of the U.S. population produced the food for the other 98%. You know, I mean, the United States has eight, eight acres of useful land for every person uh, that lives here. No, the, the, the problem in developing countries is not overpopulation, it's economic. It's economic in nature. When their standard of living is brought up, they will voluntarily have less children. Again, economic greed is responsible for this and many times by the leaders of these countries. Uh, abortion never solved overpopulation problems, for example, in China. Uh, China's one child policy largely enforced uh, through uh, uh, abortion, 400 million of them, uh, it is estimated. And what happened? It resulted in an imbalance in their population, 33 million more men than, than women. Uh, they have, men have problems finding, uh, finding wives. And, and they didn't solve the problem in the end. Uh, in any society where life is considered no more than cells evolving from a, a primal gene pool, abortion can make sense and defend it as an option. But as Christians, we believe that life is in the image of God and that any willful destruction of life, no matter how young or deformed or handicapped it is, this is an act of aggression and the reverse is also true. Mercy shown is mercy to those who are His. If you do it to them, you do it to Him and for Him as well. 
Well, the next question that comes up is, well, are there any exceptions to this? Well, what about saving the mother's life when the mother's life is truly in danger? Not her lifestyle, not saving her mother's lifestyle, saving the mother's actual life. Uh, for example, a pregnancy uh, that is taking place in a cancerous womb, for example, or a pregnancy outside the uterus and so on and so forth. Uh, in these cases, the doctors are treating the woman and, in so, and, and she's their first responsibility. And in so doing, they may harm the fetus, but it is not a direct attack on the fetus. It is a life-saving operation for the woman that may result in harm uh, to the baby that she's carrying. You know, in a, in a perfect world, there would be no such problems. There would be no rape or incest. There would be no unwanted babies. There would be no life-threatening pregnancies. In our unperfect world, imperfect world rather, the Lord extends His grace and mercy to all children who have died in this way. The one comfort that we have for all these children that have been aborted is that they are with the Lord. That's the one comfort that we have. In one way, or I've always thought, in one way or another, God will reap you know, a portion of society, a portion of the population to be his, his own. So that's one comfort that I have when I think of all these uh, babies who have, who have been aborted in this way. Uh, God also extends his grace and mercy and forgiveness to all those who because of weakness or ignorance or hardness of heart, went ahead and, and had their abortion. And he also offers strength and mercy and grace to those who risked careers and comfort, health, and went ahead and had those babies in times of crisis. In the end, for those who come to him, Jesus makes all things right and good. For the babies uh, that are brought to term and, and come into this life, for the babies that are lost, for the women uh, who have the courage to go ahead with their difficult pregnancies, for those who for whatever reason uh, succumb to the temptation to have the abortion, for all of these, Jesus has an answer for all of these, uh, for those who come to him in prayer and in repentance, uh, and that is his mercy and, and his grace. Well, that's a, 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 brief, a brief lesson on a very difficult uh, topic. Um, I've got some questions uh, here uh, for your small group uh, discussion uh, and um, we'll see you next time for the next uh, commandment in our, in our series. Question number one. Have you ever known someone who had an abortion? How did you feel about it? Question number two. Why do you think seemingly good and sincere people openly support the pro-choice movement? Question number three. Should we give instruction to young unmarried people about birth control methods in addition to the teachings about abstinence? Question number four. If your wife, sister, etc. risked death during pregnancy, would you intervene medically if it meant harming the baby? What moral or spiritual rationale would you provide for this?